Senator Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank you and the ranking member for organizing and uh, approving today's hearing. And to all of the witnesses, thank you so much for being here and for the work that you do. I want to start with a question uh, to you, Dr. Princeton. Young patients are being forced to wait in emergency rooms for up to a month, hoping an inpatient psychiatric bed will open up. And sometimes in my state, it's more than that. They have written to me recounting their experiences waiting in hospitals. They describe truly horrific experiences, such as being kept in isolation and going weeks without showers, let alone mental health care. The situation is so severe that New Hampshire used federal funds to purchase a local hospital to take these children out of the emergency room, but we know there's more work that still needs to be done, and even with the purchase of this hospital and now additional beds, uh, there are still long waits in our emergency rooms. What concrete steps can Congress take to effectively reduce youth wait times for urgent mental health care? Thank you so much for the question, Senator. I appreciate it. It is, it is the case that once someone, and especially a child, is experiencing imminent risk towards themselves and others, they do need to be in a hospital. They do need the constant surveillance. And we might think that adding more hospital beds is the answer. It certainly is an opportunity to make sure we have enough emergency services. But the problem truly has to be addressed by offering more outpatient providers that can make sure that kids never get to that level of crisis. We have the treatments. We have the science to show that it works. We just need more people to administer those treatments and keep kids from getting to that emergency stage. 750 times more funding to make sure we have enough physicians in this country than what we're providing for our entire mental health care workforce. If we had that, if we treated the likelihood that one out of every five young women will experience a major depressive episode before the age of 25, as we heard Ms. Rainier say in Alaska, one out of every four young people are going to experience severe suicidality, think what we would do if that was a physical health disorder. We would be training people to what to expect. We'd be training parents and teachers to spot the warning signs. Yeah. We would be making sure that everyone had access to treatment the minute that they started showing any symptoms of a physical health illness whatsoever. Right. But it's happening for depression. And the reason why we're seeing all of this overrun in the hospitals is because we haven't provided the workforce to make sure that we can provide outpatient treatment before we reach that crisis stage. Well, thank you. And let me follow up on the points you're making with Ms. Rainier and Dr. Durham. Um, it's important that we acknowledge the stigma around mental health in schools. And Ms. Rainier, you were just talking a little bit about uh, things opening up a little bit and people talking more about it. I received a letter from a student from Candia, New Hampshire, sharing her experience with what she considers a, is a real lack of awareness in her school. She wrote in part, Schools and workplaces are not taking mental health seriously. We do not learn about mental health in school nor the workplace. I've seen firsthand the way that these disorders can affect people. It's not seriously talked about, not taken seriously enough. It's powerful to hear students like this young woman talk openly about mental health, and we need to do more to support them, points you all have been making. So Dr. Durham and Ms. Rainier, how can we work with students to end the stigma around mental health? And I'll start with Dr. Durham, and then we'll go to Ms. Rainier. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, when I think about the patients I see at BMC in particular, I, I talked about under-resourced communities, um, mostly low-income Black and Latinx folks that come and see us. There's a huge stigma in ethnic my, minority communities, um, and we need to start, like many of people have said here, in schools, at home, but also partnering with other community organizations, the church, other systems of care that people go to other than healthcare systems, right. that we can start opening that dialogue and thinking more, more openly, sort of like Claire has done today, telling our stories. Um, and so we have a lot of initiatives, even within Boston Medical Center, of reaching out and partnering with our local churches. We have people in our department that are doing some of that work to start breaking down barriers and stigma so people can come in for treatment. Well, thank you. Ms. Rainier. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I was going to say the same thing. We can support community and local organizations. Um, some of the ones that I was in was I was introduced to Yana, You Are Not Alone Club, Suicide Prevention Trainings, but also MHAS, Mental Health Advocacy Through Storytelling. And that encouraged me to tell my story. So the program is youth-led, it's youth-founded, 
It's a group of Anchorage High School students working to decrease stigma and increase access to mental health resources through true personal short stories of mental health struggle and triumph. And we run a program, a 12 week program twice a year aiming to teach and guide conversations on mental health and storytelling and then help participants develop their own stories on mental health. And then all of our participants share the story they've developed at a final live storytelling event, kind of in the style of the Moth Radio Hour or anything else like that. So helping organizations and promoting them and you know encouraging them and funding them and things like that is really, really important. It was my own friends at this organization who taught curriculum and helped me tell my story. And it's because of those resources and that education that I opened up to my parents last year and the reason why I'm here today. Well, thank you. And I realize I'm out of time. I'll follow up, Ms. Goldsby, with a question to you about telehealth and medication-assisted treatment. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Smith. 